Welcome to Old Path and our study through the New Testament book of 2 Thessalonians. We begin that today. And uh, before we take a look at the text, there's some observations that I think are really helpful. If we take a look at, at the book itself, and in light of what we just studied in the, uh, the first book, especially the second half of chapter 4 and pretty much the rest of chapter 5, we realize that the second book here is written very much for the same reasons as the latter part of the first book. And let's remember something else. These, these happen, as far as the writings are concerned, they happen very close together in, uh, in the book first to second. And then also we know that, that uh, the first book was written very shortly after Paul had been there, within probably a year or so. So if we just use big round figures, there are a lot of interesting things that we can make just as simple observation to this. Now, in our world today, and in the Christian world, I mean, as far as, as churches, as far as how we view the Bible, um, how many churches will view what the Bible has to say, or as some churches would think, has little to say about future events, how you actually address what Paul was saying to the church here at Thessalonica and what he clearly taught them while he was there among them, um, it's, it becomes very, very quickly evident to us that the matter of eschatology and that the matter of, uh, of looking at end times events is something that was of great importance as far as Paul was concerned. Now, what it also helps us to understand is though Paul set out some very clear, I believe, um, kind of step-by-step -step matters as far as what happens as far as the tribulation is concerned and the, uh, the explanation of what we would consider as the rapture of the church, um, how those two kind of work uh, together, I believe it shows that the rapture of the church happens before the tribulation begins. We went through the timing of all of that. But what we see because of the, the prompting of this writing to second in the second book to the Thessalonians, he has to go back and address more on this same topic. So again, this is always so helpful for us when we study the scriptures. We need to make sure that we are not in the mindset that everything that we read when it comes to the text is somehow addressed directly to the 21st century because it simply isn't. So any book that's written to us, or that's written rather for us in the Bible, it had its first recipients. And in this case, it's 2,000 years ago, round figures, and it is Paul writing to a very young church about matters of eschatology and the confusion that came about because of it. And it's not a, a matter of confusion because of how Paul dealt with it. The confusion is generated by the people who are coming in to try to uh, cast doubt on what Paul was teaching. Now, with that in mind, uh, Paul has to address it, and he in particular does so in chapter 2. In chapter 2 is where he says, let me make sure that you understand what you're hearing from somebody allegedly from me is not from me. And he's doing this so that he can set the record straight on this. Now, why is that so interesting and why is that so important to us? I think if we just step back and take a very kind of common sense approach to it, what it tells us is that the devil loves confusion, especially on this topic. The topic of end things or of the last days. And really what it is, Paul is dealing with the culmination of mankind on the earth as we know it. So every bit of man's history that we can think of is kind of seen through the prism of this temporary life and as though it's going to just go on indefinitely. But the Bible does not say that. The Bible says that what we see here does not go on indefinitely. There's a day when God brings back everything to its former glory the way that it was before sin entered in. Now, between where we are right now and when we get to that forever kingdom, when everything is restored, there's a whole lot that the Bible talks about. And as far as the people who were living on the earth at the time, it is a time of just horror and destruction. And for the church, I believe it is not here for that. It has no reason to be here for that. The church is not judged alongside the, the, uh, the unrepentant and the, the unjust, the ones that God is going to be exacting punishment on and uh, judgment. Um, that's kind of something he's done in, in the past. And let's make sure that he's very good about that before utterly judging. We know that he did it with Noah, with Rahab, and there are just lots of uh, examples of it, Lot. And 
the idea that he would uh, extract or remove his people before there is total destruction, um, we have some examples of that. But that really isn't even the topic that we'll be dealing with here. In the first chapter, we want to remember again, these are, are really pretty much companion topics that are going on here. So it gives this impression as we read it, understanding that in the way of context. Paul hears that there are questions that are going on in Thessalonica about the events uh, themselves. Now, this may very well be it's a controversy just because they're thinking through it or because somebody has come in and given them cause for concern. Well, if Paul's telling you that the church is going to be taken out of here in the rapture, well, what about the people in your family that have already died? What about them? Okay. We hear those same kind of accusations now. We hear the, the same kind of doubt being thrown against those who believe that in our world today, similar ones to that. So Paul sets that in order. Here's what's going to happen as far as the church is concerned. And then God takes care of the, what we would consider the, the wrath or the day of the Lord. And he deals with that in chapter 5. Well, that news and that information would have made it back to Thessalonica. They can be settled somewhat on that. And now here is a brand new controversy that comes up. We, we can only kind of piece together little bits and pieces of it, mainly because of what we see in chapter 2. Don't, let, don't believe what you've seen, even though it may seem as though it's come from us. And so he's going to set the record straight. So as is the common problem, people would come in, no sooner does Paul leave, they, they sift through the things that the people are believing based upon what Paul says, and they start to cast doubt on him, on his authority, on what he teaches. Paul deals with that in the first part of uh, 1 Thessalonians, and then he moves on to the, the pressing issue at the latter part of the book. He's revisiting much of this same information, and in this case, he's going to give a lot more of the chronology of things that will take place. And it is not without controversy, even in the church. Now, I'll deal with that when we get to chapter 2. We're just going to be chap uh, dealing with chapter 1 today. But here's something I find just very interesting. And, and those of you who know me at all know that I make this this um, uh, this statement quite often. Uh, first and Thess uh, Second Thessalonians are should be a fascination to the entirety of the church. For those that would say we shouldn't spend time looking at end times things, it's too confusing, it's too difficult, and there's too many different opinions, and it's too polarizing, and all the excuses that they give, I just want to find it, point out how important it is that to a very young church, Paul prioritizes this particular topic so much so that he taught it to them while he was there, but he also goes back and goes over all of these matters because they are such a, a, a matter that are causing that is causing difficulty in the church because of bad information. Now, last thing I'll say on this, and then we'll get into the text. I think of some of the biggest churches that there are, and some of the biggest celebrity pastors that you'll find anywhere. And so, these are the types of churches that seem to have the same message all the time. There's really no substance to what they do because it's always kind of going to fit a box that doesn't really become confrontational to anyone. People are able to hear what they want to hear. They can get very excited about the things that they hear. It's usually directed so much at you, the individual, and not so much at the content of what is actually in the scripture. It's a way of trying to make you feel good. It's just the way that church is done nowadays. So you are not going to see very many sermons, if we want to call them that, or whatever they want to call it. It's really just usually entertaining the people in front of them. There's not going to be much in the way of, of things taught out of 1st or 2nd Thessalonians. You're just not going to find it because the content will not be something that they want to talk about because it's not only controversial, but it makes people uncomfortable. And frankly, I don't think any of these guys have a desire to know the topic. I, I find most of these guys are so incredibly lazy in their scholarship and in, in what they want to do. And again, don't get me wrong. I don't think you need all kinds of advanced degrees because going to seminary and getting that kind of education usually just means you're going to repeat what you have learned in those particular places, not necessarily that you believe them th those things for yourself. So what you would hope is that every single pastor who ever comes to the Word and teaches anything out of it has studied it for themselves and is not influenced by the people around them, but they take what they get directly from the Word and they do their due diligence. That's what you would hope. But this is a book that doesn't get a lot of uh, discussion. Uh, churches that teach all the way through the scripture will certainly come to it. People who do uh, want to talk about the particular topics that are dealt with in Thessalonians will refer to it very often. And uh, we have 
a prime example of that as we looked at the end of the last book, chapters 4 from verse 13, really kind of on through the end of the book, um, very heavily weighted towards eschatology, end times, the, the rapture, the wrath of God, the day of the Lord. We're going to see a repeat of that here in chapter 2, but Paul is going to deal with something first, which is once again to reassure the church at Thessalonica, here's how things are. And, you know, again, they're very troubled by some things that they've heard. So with all of that said, if the church that you currently attend you don't find them ever dealing with these matters. You don't find them dealing with First and Second Thessalonians or, or companion types of passages. That'll pretty much tell you that that church is not really all that concerned about the world around you. Eventually, a pastor who's going to be teaching through the scriptures is going to come up to matters that are dealing with eschatology or the end times, and you're going to be able to use as a source bit of information the things that were shared by Paul to the church at Thessalonica are things that we can apply to our current day because the things that Paul discussed have not yet taken place historically. They still must be future. So yeah, they're relevant to us. But let's leave things in their proper understanding. The things that he says here to the church in Thessalonica is not what's happening in most churches in the world today. However, what he talks about that are next things to happen after this that's when it starts to become applicable to churches everywhere, no matter their level of trouble or distress or whatever else. Now, chapter 1 is where we're going to begin. Paul will start with a standard greeting, and then he's going to move on to his, his happiness about this particular church and how, how grateful he is that even in the midst of all of their turmoil and all of the upheaval that's taking place in the world around them, they seem to have a good focus on on being faithful to the gospel, and they're enduring a tremendous amount of affliction, a tremendous amount of difficulty at the hands of those who persecute them. We know very little about them. It may be a multitude of different people that are coming against them. We know that there's the influence of the pagan world around them. Look at where they live. Okay, so Thessalonica is what we what we call Macedonia, but think think Athens and think Corinth, and then move up to the north. And right as the Aegean does this up at the top, there you would have Thessalonica. Paul went there at the beginning of his second missionary journey once they ventured over into Europe out of modern-day Turkey. And Thessalonica was one of the first on that schedule. So with all of that said, there is all the influence of the pagan world. The other things that are coming against them and the difficulty, we know that there are those who were really stirred up from the synagogues at Paul's message. And so the church that's left there is also going to have that problem. And then there are those who would come into the church trying to cast doubt on Paul's ministry, which may be different from all the others. So there are a lot of, of external forces that are really making life difficult for this church here at Thessalonica. So Paul wants to once again encourage and reassure them letting them know that all of this thing is temporary. And I again, I, when you read this, I believe it's pretty clear from it that Paul really doesn't expect that all the things that he has been discussing with this church at Thessalonica and how God will end all of this is really something that he thinks is going to happen way down the line. My belief is that he thought it was going to happen in his lifetime. And you catch that urgency in him. We'll get an example of that just here as we look at it today. So chapter 1. Let's, uh, let's take a look at it. It's just a short chapter. It's got 12 verses in it. We should be able to take care of it all uh, in this time. So let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for what we are able to learn from it. We would pray, God, that you would give us understanding as we study your word, that we would be encouraged by what we read. We pray, God, that you would give us great knowledge in your word, and that this would also, as it should have been to them, as Paul intends it, an encouragement to this church, knowing the times in which they live, also that it would be an encouragement to us in the times in which we live, as we all await your return. So we give you thanks. We pray that you would glorify yourself through the teaching of your word. Help us to be attentive, and by the Spirit, God, would you give us the ability to understand these things and make complete sense of them in our own minds and our own understanding. We give you all thanks in Jesus' name. All right, so 1 Thessalonians, uh, Silvanus and Timothy, as Paul mentions, these are the people that stayed there when Paul was run out of Thessalonia, or the, the, yeah, Thessalonica and um, made his way down into, uh, ultimately he went to uh, Athens and then 
onto Corinth. Uh, you can read that in chapter 17 of the book of Acts. So these are the guys who are with him. Now, he, these same people more than likely were the ones who brought report back to Paul about the things that had taken place. Now he uses uh, uh, this occasion to say, these guys are now with me and they greet you as well. So he says this, to the church of the Thessalonians, uh, in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice the distinction between the two. Even though there are those in our world today that tell you they're the same person, he refers to them separately. There's the Father and then there is the Son. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is fitting, and that is this reason, because your faith grows exceedingly and the love of every one of you all abounds towards each other. Now, for a church that is in distress, as you're going to see that he addresses, this is something that's so good and so encouraging, because I'm sure we've all been here. Anytime that there is something that is really troubling to us in our spirit and in, in a spiritual matter, it's so easy to become so locked in on that that you forget all the other things. So here Paul says, before I get to the things that are troubling you personally, let me address the things that should be of comfort to you. And so he does that at the outset. We're bound to thank God always for you. And why does he want to do that? Why does he want to acknowledge or what does he want to acknowledge? He says, because your faith, it grows exceedingly and the love for every one of you all abounds towards each other. So they're their understanding, their faith, their trust in the Lord, and their, their faithfulness to, the, to, to him and in their actions and in the things that they do, it grows and in excess exceedingly. And it's shown in this way, your love towards one another. So that's a great indication of where it's taking place. Verse 4, so that we ourselves, it, it's so well known that we ourselves, we will boast of you among the churches of God uh, for you, for your patience and for your faith in all of the persecutions and tribulations that you endure. So here's the topic. When we're talking about churches, Paul would say, when we're talking among the churches, you're brought up. And when I bring you up and when you are brought up, here's the things that people remember. The patience that you have, this, this it's a difficult thing, but your, your patience means that you're not focused on what's happening right here, right now, but you have we would call it the long game in sight. It's the end of things. It's recognizing that it's only for a time. So your patience, your faith, even though or in all of your persecutions and your tribulations that you endure. Now, it's an interesting word here. This this word tribulations is, uh, is the Greek thlipsis. And so when you look up the different places where thlipsis is used, it's, it's just... Uh, it's not being careful with the text because thalipsis is used sometimes as here with very temporary uh, types of, of uh, difficulties that you may be incurring. It is also the same word that Jesus uses when he refers to uh, great tribulation. And so the, the, the matter is that this could be the things that happen here and now, but Jesus refers to a time of tribulation that is future to theirs, and the difficulty would be that's during that seven years of what we would call the tribulation that happens between, I believe, the rapture and his second coming. And it's the time that the Bible describes as, from Jesus' own words, like nothing that's ever been seen before. And we get the details of it starting at, I believe, chapter 6 of the book of Revelation, all the way until he returns in chapter 19. So the destruction of the earth, the destruction of the people, and uh, how many people die during that time and how the cataclysmic things that happen to the earth are without precedent. And so Jesus refers to it as a time of great tribulation as the world has never seen before. Philipsis, tribulation. But it's the same word that you'll find him use other places. Paul talks about it as being philipsis or tribulation, but it's very much temporary. And it's, in this case, it is just relegated to the people therein uh, in Thessalonica, and he's not using it in the broadest sense of the term that it's a worldwide kind of a thing. So you can find places where uh, uh, tribulation is really kind of directed at particular people. Um, Jesus uses it also in, in uh, uh, John chapter 16, verse 33, where he talks about that in this world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer because I've overcome the world. Philipsis. 
So it is the, the problem that you have with tribulation and difficulty, trial, and yet it's not speaking of something that is worldwide and that it would happen to all of mankind as Jesus uses that word in Matthew chapter 24. So if you're not familiar with it, you know we have a moment. Let's do it. Matthew 24. The whole of Matthew 24 kind of deals with this topic and uh, the end of time and all. Um, let's see, I didn't write down the reference, but I should be able to find it here pretty quick. Yeah, it's verse uh, 21. And it says, For there will be great tribulation, such as not has been seen uh, since the beginning of the world until this time, nor, how, nor shall ever be. Until that time, nothing's ever been like it. But that word tribulation, verse 21, is thalipsis. Same one that Paul uses here, uh, speaking about what's happening for those at Thessalonica. All of this is important because of how he takes this topic and moves it into chapter 2. So let's go back to uh, 1 Thessalonians 1, 2 Thessalonians 1, I'm sorry. So he says this, when we're talking about you, when we get to discuss the churches and yours in particular, here's the things that you're known for. Patience, faith in, um, in the midst of, even though you have persecutions and tribulations that you have to endure. Yeah. Sorry for the edit, I had a phone go off. So in verse 5, we get to this. Now, this this patience and the enduring of the persecutions and the tribulation, that is something he says, this is manifest evidence of the righteous judgment of God that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you also suffer. Now, this is his way of saying what you're going through is ultimately all of the stuff that's going and being done towards you will ultimately fall upon those people, but it will be done in a righteous manner. So the, the difficulty that, that is coming against them really is by no way able to be compared to what's going to happen to those who are what we would consider enemies of God. And God being righteous in all that he does, the day will come when you will be vindicated. And the difficulty that you go through now is temporal, but God will ultimately judge in a righteous manner those who look to do trouble to you. And so there is that day when this will all be manifest. It is for here and now that promise that this will take place, but knowing that when it does finally come to pass, things will be as they should be. Verse 6, since it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you. So again, same word, ellipsis, dealing with what the people are doing in a direction towards those at Thessalonica. The day will come when it will be, if you will, tables turned, and not because of God being vindictive, but ultimately, every single person has to stand before God someday and give account for their lives. Those who would accept his free gift of, of eternal life will be accepted and will be rewarded, and they will be glorified. They will be made to, uh, to sit next to him, as we can best understand this in the, in the eternal sense, but we will be seated with him. It's an eternal thing. And for those who would reject him, again, it's an eternal problem. So whatever may befall the church, the church should always remember it is but for a time and tables will be turned at some point. So verse 7, And then to give to you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. Now, that is an interesting thing because some people look at this as being uh, directed as a, a matter of the... Um, uh, of being the second coming when Jesus returns to the earth, or others would see it as being part of, uh, or being referred to as the rapture of the church. So when does all of this take place? So we'll go through a couple of verses on this, and then let's go back and see what he may be referring to. Some may look at it, um, when we get back to it, some may look at it as though it will be the rapture that, that uh, Paul spoke about, starting at verse 13 of the last book in chapter 4, or it may be speaking about when Jesus returns to the earth, and then all of that takes place. Um, I believe it is the first of those two. I believe it's the rapture of the church, because the day of the Lord is not a literal 24 hours. As other times, when that's used idiomatically of a period of time, not always necessarily set in stone, it's when it says the day of the Lord, it's the time of the Lord. It's this particular series of events. 
I believe it begins, the day of the Lord, I believe, begins with the the church being raptured because then God is able to do or will do the things that he is going to do. It lasts for those seven years and it culminates with Jesus returning to the earth and a very, uh, a very brief rebellion is put down. Actually, when he comes, they try to make war against him. And we know at that point that uh, there is a um, huge destruction of people. Satan is bound for a thousand years that we read in uh, chapters uh, 19 and then into 20. Of, um, of the book of Revelation. So with that being said, let's read a little bit more, and here's, I'll give my reasons why I believe this, this refers to the rapture, not the second coming. To give to you who are troubled rest along with us when the Lord is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who did not know him, or who did not know God, rather, and on those who did not obey the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. These will be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power, uh, whom he com- or when rather he comes in that day to be glorified in his saints and admired among those who believe because of our testimony among you that was believed. So, verse uh, 11, therefore, we also pray. So, really, the, the, the major part of this is kind of verses... I guess you could say 7 to 10. Now, I believe that you have what could be seen as elements of both things, the culmination of him coming back. And what what gives people the impression that this is speaking of the second coming because it's with the angels, um, there is also um, some things that where Paul says that you'd be gathered with us. So if Paul is thinking the second coming, well, the church is already together. It's not as though... Paul being where he is and the church there at Thessalonica, um, they're separated by geography. So for him to be making the promise as he does here in verse 7, and to give you who are troubled rest along with us when the Lord is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, that gives the impression that it's something that happens when they are in different locations. If Paul's referring to the second coming, there's no reason for him to say that you'll be given rest at that time. They would already have rest if it's at his second coming because the church is gathered to him. So I hope that you understand where I'm going with that. But as we go through this, we can say that all of the judgment that's being spoken about uh, will be happening throughout the tribulation and as he returns at his second coming. So to me, this is where he begins with this matter of the rapture, but then it leads into the way that Jesus will be coming to the earth And as he opens the seals, the judgments begin to happen. And then he physically returns at the end of those years of tribulation. Again, Revelation chapter 19. So if we read it, I believe down into this, the day of the Lord begins and Paul says, don't be so troubled. You'll be gathered with the rest of us to him. And then he begins this whole process of judging the unrepentant. That's everything that you see from chapter 6 on in the book of Revelation. Though again, there are those who would believe that the church is here for the first part of the tribulation. Again, not going to argue that whole thing. Go back and look at the series that we did through uh, Second Thessalonians. I'm sorry, First Thessalonians. The, there were three of them that we did uh, through chapter 4, verse 13, on through uh, chapter 5, and uh, dealing with the wrath. So you can go back and read those, or watch those rather, and you'll see what I'm talking about with that. But let's follow this along as a chronology. If we, or as I believe, as Paul refers to the church coming back, being gathered up to him, and then Jesus begins the process of the judgment that takes place. Because again, he's the one who is opening the seals. So he begins this process. And that happens in chapter 6 of Revelation. I believe it would be after the rapture of the church, but it is only kind of the opening of the tribulation. So let's be, you know, make sure we're following along here. So it begins at verse 7. To give you who are troubled rest along with us at what time? See, he, 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 he attaches this to a particular event. When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. So that's going to be taking place as all of the things begin to happen at the, the time of the tribulation when it begins. But we're gathered to him as that begins to happen. So, in flaming fire, 
uh, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Those would be the ones who would not have been taken away. So when would this be taking place? Well, that all starts in the tribulation. If this is made as exclusively a second coming, it's jumping over all of those things that happen during the book of Revelation from chapter 6 because the second coming is at chapter 19. But what will be taking place on the earth is to dwell upon those who would not come to faith in him and who rejected the gospel. Those are the ones being judged here on earth. So, at uh, verse um, at verse 8, In flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, these shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. That is even further into the, into the, uh, uh, the future. Because when a person dies, especially from the time that Paul's talking about, these are people who are not instantly sent to what we would consider hell. <clears throat> they're in, they're in, that gets misused. The eternal place for all of them is the lake of fire. And that you find in chapter 20 of the book of Revelation. So Paul talks about these people that will be judged will also be resurrected. It's referred to as the second death in Revelation 20. They're brought back into a place of standing before God to be judged at the second death and thrown into the lake of fire. So again, a lot of people look at that. And, and again, when you hear lake of fire, we want to remember that this is something that that John is given a vision of in the book of Revelation, but some people love to mock that idea because they're trying to think of it in human terms as some place you could go visit today. Let's make sure we understand that everything that John is seeing in the book of Revelation, especially when you get to chapter 19 and then through the end of the book, is something that the world has not seen in, in its perfection. It hasn't seen it since the fall of Adam and Eve when things were created perfectly. So. You know, if people have a problem with the wording or even the description of that, they need to get out of their temporary little minds and recognize that what's being described is something we've never seen before. So it's a lake of torment, of burning fire. And so it's just what it's given as a description, but to think of it as being just fanciful words that, that can be just ridiculed and, and you know cast aside, we need to recognize what the scripture says. This is a time when those who die in their in their... Uh, rejection of God are going to be kept for a time until they are having to give account in the final times. But a lot of other things play out in Revelation 19 and 20, including a thousand years in which the world populates again, if we take the Bible literally. So again, read it for yourself. It's pretty straightforward. At chapter 19, starting at around verse 11, you get the, the return of Jesus to the earth, puts down a very brief rebellion. There's really not much of a battle that goes on there. And then he sets up a kingdom that lasts for a thousand years until you finally get to that great white throne judgment and the lake of fire at the end of chapter 20. So you can go read that for yourself. Yep. Again, sorry for the edit. I had a little uh, problem here in the studio. Verse 9, we're told this. So there will be punished, um, they shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. And then in verse 10, that when he comes in that day uh, to be glorified in his saints and to be admired among all of those who believe because our testimony uh, among you was believed. So again, this fits nicely with the idea of that happening at the front end of the tribulation. And so who is it that is going to be looking forward to and being so blessed by his return? That would be the church. The people who are here on earth when he comes back at his second coming, that is not necessarily the case. But the church would already be gathered to him when he comes back in Revelation 19. Those are the ones that are, are with him. They come with him in the clouds. So to me, it, it seems pretty clear that what we're talking about here, though it shadows from tribulation into his second coming, is not jumping over, Paul's not talking about jumping over the entirety of the seven years of tribulation and focusing only on his second coming. I don't believe that the pieces in between here fit anywhere else other than from the rapture of the church through the tribulation to his second coming. It's all of those things taken as one, one instance and one, I shouldn't say instance, but one continuing time period. 
So with that being said, he says, therefore, now because of all of what he's just said, we also pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and to fulfill all of his good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with you. So this is that prayer. Here's we're always praying that you would endure, that you would just continue on just as you have being counted worthy, just numbered among those because your your faith and in whom you believe will deliver you to that point. And so, yeah, this is a great thing. We should all be praying for one another. That idea of being counted worthy. Let's make sure that we understand also this worthiness is about is not about our works and the things that we do. Because none of us are able to warrant, none of us are able to earn what it is that God gives us freely here. So we should be very, very careful when we you know, look at passages like this and think that they're saying something more than they actually are. The counted worthy is based on what he has done because of our trust in him and the worthiness. No one is worthy of salvation. We are worthy of eternal separation because of sin. Only if that sin has been covered in his blood and has been forgiven are we then worthy. And it's not because of us, it's because of him. So, verse 12. That the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified uh, and um, glorified in you or through your lives, and that you in him according to the grace of our God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, Paul is saying all of these things as encouragement, and he's kind of setting the table, if you will, for what he's about to deal with in chapter 2. Because it would give the impression, as we study it next week, that what he has has currently been working on is to say, let me counter what, what appears as though someone has brought to you as though it was us who had said it. And let us comfort you and let you know how these things will take place. Because again, from what we can glean from chapter 2, they were, some were of the consideration and thinking, uh-oh, Jesus has already returned for the church and now we're in the place of tribulation or some kind of problem like that. They believed that the tribulation had already come and that they were in the midst of it. So clearly, if they believed that there was a second coming or, a, a, I'm sorry, a rapture of the church, how did we miss it? Why is this happening? Where did we get it wrong? Just think of all the confusion that could come from that. And again, I believe that same confusion is still taking place in our world today among the church. So we'll go ahead and pick up at chapter 2 next week, and uh, we'll take a look. This is where there is a lot of controversy in the church over a, a few verses and a couple of words in those verses. So we'll take that on uh, next week. And uh, if you have any questions on the things that have been shared so far, uh, even back into the last ones, feel free to comment, and uh, you can do so on the YouTube channel. Or you can contact us through the website, and uh, we want to just uh, thank you for being a part of this. and. Um, and for your participation in the ministry. We're grateful for that. And I also want to just uh, pray that as you study through these things, that they would be understandable to you. And again, if they're not, then please contact us. The website is oldpath.net. Um, so you can go to the, the church there. Um, I'm sorry, oldpaththeology.net, oldpaththeology.net. And uh, we have a uh, contact us page there where you can send it to us and we'll get your email and we can correspond with you that way. So we'll pick it up chapter two next week. And uh, between now and then, go ahead and read ahead. Do your diligence and pray through uh, what you read and, and what you study and that God would bring you clarity. So bless you as uh, you study through his word. And I pray that it would be incredibly rewarding to you. Mm -hmm.